Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as always, thanks for joining us today. We have uh, a lot of information to get through. I'll just tell you at the top, we're going to try to describe as we always do our daily data and give you the context of what's happening with COVID across the state. Going to then spend some time on um, crisis care and the crisis care continuum and some of the efforts that the state is taking to work with our counties and our hospitals. Uh, to be prepared and do all we can to support patient care. I'll be joined by uh, Director of the Department of Aging, Kim McCoy-Wade, a colleague of mine who's been spectacular and is going to help me talk through some of that information. We'll then go to uh, the regional stay-at-home order and uh, what we're seeing in terms of projections and frankly dig in a little bit to how we make the projections four weeks out so many of you can understand that a little better. And then uh, it is Tuesday after all and tier Tuesday we're going to talk about any tier updates that we have. So we'll go right to the first slide. So uh, we've talked a little bit about this. They're like high case numbers, uh, lower than we'd seen before, but 31,245 cases reported today. Our seven-day average still nearly 37,500. Uh, you can see that the today, uh, today number, lower than the seven-day average, just goes along with the point that the governor and I have been making, many others, that some signs that the case numbers are stabilizing. Uh, however, our test positivity has been, uh, thankfully, not going up too much, but stable in this 12.5% range today, 12.6, 14-day positivity uh, in the face of nearly 246,000 tests. Remind you that we've been uh, averaging over 300,000 tests um, over the last many days. Next slide. Again, the comparison are seven-day positivities at 12%, 14-day hanging there uh, consistently at 12.6%. Again, a lower seven-day positivity versus the 14-day shows that the most recent days have been slightly lower than those other, that, that sort of first week, those first seven days in that 14-day range, which um, from this standpoint is good news. Um, that said, nearly 19% increase over the past two weeks in our test positivity, which is something we've been highlighting for all of you over the last many days. Next slide. Again, we've been focused as we should be about the intense critical situation in our hospitals across the state. Uh, we're looking at the numbers, over 20,000 current hospital admissions due to COVID seen a 36.5% increase in the last 14 days. This is a tremendous amount of work for these hospital systems, something we'll spend a little bit more talk time talking about in a moment. Similarly, in the intensive care units, hospitalizations have increased over 35% in the past 14 days, uh, now over 4,300 total ICU admissions across the state. Again, a theme today will be, and this is not evenly distributed across the state, uh, the northern part of the state still seeing capacity that uh, the hospitals can not just surge into, but even in some of the routine capacity, there's space, ability to deliver routine emergency care for things like heart, heart issues, uh, uh, heart attacks, strokes, uh, other trauma, car accidents, et cetera, still very strong. But in Southern California, uh, quite a different story. As we reflected yesterday, hospitals that uh, are running out of staff, having to use rooms that they don't traditionally do longer than normal, um, much longer than normal wait times in emergency departments, et cetera. I think very important critical difference between the North and the South right now. Next slide, please. So I wanted to spend a moment discussing crisis care in this crisis care continuum. Many have been tracking uh, conversations that we started early on, well before we thought we needed them, working broadly with a whole number of people in the state uh, to talk through what is this continuum. Uh, just to sort of level set and give you a little sense, uh, we try to spend, and in normal times, we're, our hospitals are delivering care in what we call the conventional care section of this chart. You'll see that the space is uh, usually 
what we'd expect, single bed, uh, single rooms with single beds, uh, double rooms or group rooms with uh, appropriate number of beds, ICUs with patients in one bay, emergency departments who aren't boarding and keeping patients who really need ICU care no longer than normal, staff um, used in the sort of usual complement of staff that you'd expect in each unit, supplies that are readily available um, and that are uh, you know available not just on the nursing floor, or the, the, the medical ward, but also in the warehouses of each hospital, and that we're sort of at this usual level of care. Contingency care, which frankly, most hospitals in California are operating today in contingency care. This is where you start to see space in the hospital that is uh, used for other types of care. Here's an example, the post-op or the pre-op beds uh, in certain hospitals are now being used to serve COVID patients or non-COVID patients to make sure that we have all the care spaces we need. Again, single uh, occupancy rooms converted to double or even more occupancy rooms. Staff who are working longer shifts in different staffing configurations with different levels of supervision. Supplies, you're in this mode of trying to conserve them, adapt them, occasionally reusing supplies that you would otherwise dispose of, um, again, doing that safely, and then levels of care, uh, functionally equivalent, but they may be, you may be delaying movement of patients between levels of care for some rate limiting steps such as staff or space. Um, and then what we are spending so much of our time trying to avoid across the state, making sure that hospitals don't move past this contingency care area, uh, avoiding this crisis care, where you're seeing uh, space used, not just in unusual ways, but that the space doesn't have all that it needs, that you're using cots instead of uh, hospital beds, that uh, units where you normally have all of your monitored patients on, on different important monitors to keep uh, managing care, that they are in other parts of the hospital that they aren't usually uh, found in staff are working significantly in different configurations, supplies. And I'm gonna use the word here that I think is, it's an important one to emphasize that in crisis care, you are in situations with occasionally you have to ration certain supplies, certain therapies, um, and even in a case where you may have to ration your staff, that there might be situations where uh, certainly staff are stretched pretty thin and not every patient gets the same level of attention that we would hope they would in either conventional or contingency care situations. And then the level of care is in crisis. You may have to triage medical care, decide how you're gonna use other scarce resources. Again, something that we need to plan for, be prepared around, but do everything in our power, power today to keep us from being in this situation across the state, not just uh, you know within the region, but every single facility providing care to COVID patients. We're working hard to make sure we can keep them out of crisis care as long and as much as possible. Next slide, please. So what's our current situation here? Uh, you know, certainly with the current surge, many hospitals are being stretched to provide the care we want and expect in California. I think often of an analogy or a comparison to a rubber band that you do stretch, and you can certainly stretch many rubber bands pretty far, as we are stretching many of our hospitals pretty far. But we know that that stretch has a limit before it breaks, before we push them into a situation where they're making the kind of decisions about resources and staff that I just walked through. Um, I do believe that hospitals are handling this surge as well as possible, and they're adapting their operations in space in very important, innovative ways to make sure we can do as much as we can on the campuses of the hospital. We learned early on through uh, hours, weeks, uh, months of planning for alternate care sites, pop-up medical facilities throughout our state that the best option we have is to continue to work with the assets at the hospitals as long and as much as possible that's where the pharmacies are, that's where the labs are, that's where the personnel are that can make care happen. 
better, smarter, and more efficiently, efficiently and in a, a higher quality way. So we continue to work uh, to bring as much care at those in those existing hospitals as possible. But we do have to acknowledge that we need to be prepared for the possibility that some hospitals will need to resort to crisis care. That in which, uh, as I said, medical professionals have to make hard choices and um, allocate resources different than we usually do. Next slide, please. Hospitals and crisis care continuum, as these resources become more scarce and as hospitals are pushed to their limit, hospital crisis care guidelines planning and implementation become critical to ensure the best care possible is delivered to all Californians. This is, uh, this is what we've spent many, many months on working with a number of partners and Kim will be walking us through that in just a minute, but it's to emphasize that this care needs to be guided by ethics, equity, and in a transparent way. If hospitals, if individual hospitals in a county or re region report implementing crisis care, that they've moved beyond contingency care, then other hospitals will be asked to share their resources and temporarily change their operations. This is something we've been having many, many discussions, late night discussions and conversations with hospital leaders, association leaders across uh, impacted regions to make sure we are preparing for a hospital that maybe isn't as big as some of the ones we're used to are in communities where there's a great disproportionate impact that have had a hard time keeping their staff, uh, uh, you know, healthy and in, in the hospitals working, that uh, we may need to call upon uh, some bigger facilities to support smaller facilities, uh, less impacted facilities facilities to support the more impacted ones. We expect to do that uh, with a great deal of planning and to do it with haste when it needs to happen so that we can continue to save as many lives as possible. Next slide, please. So now I'll ask Kim McCoy-Wade uh, to go over the next few, sli few slides. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Secretary, and thank you so much for including the Department of Aging in this conversation of great importance to Californians of all ages. We wanted to start with how we are taking our commitment to be a California for all to meet this challenging moment and really just lay out the state's high level goals. Uh, first and foremost, as the Secretary said, that hospitals are able to remain in that conventional, that normal operational state of business or contingent care if need be but stay in those two zones for as long as possible. Equally important is that we're all in this together and that all hospitals in a region work together, along with county partners from public health, from emergency medical services, to support each hospital to remain in that contingent care as long as possible. Now, we also know that a third goal is that we're prepared. That's why the guidelines have come out in June and why we're moving into implementation now that we are prepared and that that preparation comes from the best California values of equity, fairness, and transparency. And that we only get there uh, to that crisis care as an absolute last resort. And of course, this all has to be clear and transparent and today is one step in that effort to make more information clear from the state, from your hospital partners, from your county partners, so that people do have the confidence about how we're navigating this very challenging situation. Next slide, please. So to do that, we always try to be person-centered and data-driven and begin by listening. So this uh, winter and spring, we were able, and I wanna just uh, commend my colleagues at the Department of Public Health for their great leadership and partnership in this effort. In listening to hospitals, to health systems, to local health jurisdictions, emergency services, the aging community, disability community, and more, to hear from uh, those members of our California community about what was needed to do effective uh, crisis care continuum planning. We, this spring, formed an advisory group with some of California's leading doctors, medical ethicists, aging, disability, and health equity leaders to advise us, to be that sounding board, to work through these issues in an expert, uh, in an expert and collaborative way. And throughout, again, we are monitoring uh, this field uh, for state and national guidelines, and in fact, even international, looking at other examples. Uh, leading California health systems uh, have been models to us as well. 
and continuing evolving literature as we all uh, face the COVID moment together. Just to drill down on my next and last slide, I wanna be very specific about what it means to be a California for all in the crisis care moment. Next slide, please. Medical decisions cannot be based on multiple factors that are listed out here. And we're just gonna take a second because they're each very important. They cannot be based on age, race, disability, chronic medical conditions, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, national origin, language spoken, ability to pay, weight or size, socioeconomic status, insurance status, perceived self-worth, perceived quality of life, immigration status, incarceration status, housing status, past or future use of resources. What is the approach that California is taking and is recommended in our guidelines in June and reiterated in our implementation guidance this week is that medical decisions primarily are grounded in the likelihood of surviving in the near term. That is the appropriate basis for these decisions. These other factors are not. So with that uh, baseline, I'd like to hand it back to our secretary for the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, and thank you for your tremendous leadership on this topic, but so many uh, in the Department of Aging, your work on the Master Plan for Aging, and a number of other efforts. Uh, California is better because of your leadership, and so thank you uh, and, and grateful for all you've done. Next slide, please. So just to bring this section to a close, I know there'll be questions in the Q&A and happy to take them, uh, but just to be clear, our, our role, the state's role in crisis care is to help hospitals prevent moving into crisis care. That's first and foremost. That means getting a good sense of what's happening on the ground, communicating with our local leaders and our hospital leaders, ensuring then also that hospitals are planning for crisis care. No one wants to have crisis care situations sneak up on them. We've tried to give time to plan that each hospital can create their committees of experts, trained professionals, not just in providing care, but thinking about crisis care. So they make decisions based on the equity principles, the transparency principles, the fairness principles that we have outlined outlined earlier, and that we also help hospitals remain in crisis care uh, for as little time as possible, that they quickly return to contingency or conventional care. What the state does not do is determine facility by facility when they resort to crisis care standards. That's determined by the hospital based on the need for hospitalization and the available resources. We have worked, the final statement I, may, I will make, is we have worked as a state so hard and so long to be ready. We did so much early on in this pandemic response. We've learned a lot. We've given ourselves time to learn, not just from our own experiences, but experiences across the country and the globe, how to care for and successfully care for patients with COVID, people who had bad experiences and died early in the pandemic today are living. We must continue to work to make sure the hospitals have a chance to provide that care to all Californians who need it. Just because of your zip code or your understanding of the healthcare delivery system, um, maybe, uh, maybe you don't have access to the same level of resources. We wanna do all that we can that we make sure patients uh, in underserved, lower resource communities, places where hospitals are overwhelmed, that we give some of those patients, as many as possible, a chance to get care in areas that have capacity. Even though they're stretched, they may not be stretched as far. And making sure we work to do that with our hospital partners and other leaders is a top priority right now for California. And it's in play in Southern California in many, many ways today. And we are working hard to make sure we do all we can to keep Californians safe and well cared for. Next slide. 
So we have been talking now for about the regional stay at home order for over three weeks. Counties have now been in, some counties have been under the regional stay at home order for the minimum three weeks that were required under the order. So today I wanna walk through what we're projecting to see for those first two uh, regions that are eligible to exit the regional stay at home order and then spend a few minutes explaining uh, the details of how we set those projections. So to remind you, five regions across the state, uh, currently four of these regions, all but the Northern California region, 27.9% available ICU capacity there today. Um, all but that region, the Northern California region, are under the regional stay-at-home order. Uh, the first two regions to enter that regional stay-at-home order were San Joaquin Valley and Southern California. As you can see here, that our calculations show a 0% uh, ICU capacity available today. Really what that means isn't that there isn't a single bed open. Hospitals that we just described are doing all that they can to staff up and create space for beds. What it means is that these two regions are in their surge capacity in the aggregate. So one hospital, one community, one part of a county, one whole county may actually be um, only all of their hospitals in surge capacity while other parts of the region still have capacity. So the point of a regional approach is to make sure that we take care of as many Californians with those regional assets as possible. And this is what we're doing in Southern California and the San Joaquin Valley. Next slide. So again, the reminder is that we set the regional stay at home order and uh, regions must remain under the order for at least three weeks and shall continue in that uh, order until the ICU projections are above or equal to 15%. So today the order will remain because those projections do not show that San Joaquin Valley and Southern California um, have uh, projected four weeks out ICU capacity over 15%. So they will remain under the order for the time being. Uh, we uh, uh, essentially are projecting that the ICU capacity is not improving in Southern California and San Joaquin Valley and that demand will continue to exceed capacity. Uh, and uh, we will continue to run these assessments as we've committed to on a daily basis and update them daily to the public. Next slide, please. So here are some more specifics. If you look at the data, the inputs into our projections for San Joaquin Valley, we look at the case rate, 97.5 cases per 100,000 per day, transmission rate or that R effective that we constantly talk about at 1.13, again, we want that to be under one, ideally, certainly at one to make sure that we aren't continuing to increase our transmission in a community or an area. But here, 1.13 still means that uh, we are still seeing increased rates of transmission. So the ICU demand exceeds capacity for San Joaquin Valley at four weeks. Similarly, Southern California, 130.1 case rate per 100,000 per day population, a slightly lower are effective, but still well above one. And then similarly, the ICU projection four weeks out is demand exceeds capacity. So for this reason, these two regions will continue under the regional stay at home order moving forward. Next slide, please. So, I've highlighted a bit of this already, but I wanted to share some uh, information on how these projections are made. And you saw some of the inputs on the prior slide, but I'll go a little deeper here. So as I said, these projections are gonna be run by the California Department of Public Health data team, uh, pretty incredible scientists, uh, uh, statisticians, epidemiologists, folks who've been thinking hard, uh, even individuals who are spending time working themselves in hospitals and understand the uh, where the rubber meets the road with these calculations. I'm um, doing this on a daily basis and updating us and the public regularly. These projections are really based on four regional inputs, so factors that are regionally based that come into our projections. The first one, and, and uh, much of this won't be a surprise, but it's important to walk through, 
The current ICU capacity in any region is the first detail uh, that, that we start with. The second one is that current seven day average case rate. The third is the current transmission rate that are effective. And then the fourth is a current rate of ICU admission. These four factors come together and certainly I'll just walk through a little bit uh, of the more specifics uh, to understand the projections. So if you are already at quite a significant deficit with your current ICU capacity, the likelihood that your four week projection is gonna be above 15% is going to be much smaller. Similarly, if your seven day average case rate is still very, very high, it is, we know that, that those cases are going to end up in the hospital 10 to 12 days later at a rate of about 12%. And then some of those cases, about 12% of those cases, at a minimum, between 10 and 30, we've seen, depending on the region, are going to end up in your ICU a few days after that. So that seven-day average case rate is a key factor to help us determine this projection. Then, of course, it's about transmission rate. How fast is the virus spreading in your neck of the woods in the region that is under the stay at home order? The higher it is, the less likely a projection is going to be above 15% considering moving forward. That are effective, takes into account actual rates of transmission, as well as factors around our stay at home order, our ability to keep and be compliant with masks, et cetera. We have seen over the last week or week and a half, some reductions in the R effective statewide, but there are still regions of California in the Central Valley in Southern California that still have very high R effectives, that transmission rate, which is going to make it harder and less likely that a four week projection is gonna be above 15%. And then of course, if a region is having individuals who are becoming sicker, those who get infected are uh, more vulnerable, higher risk for severe disease, then it's more likely that the ICU admission rate uh, among the patients in the hospital will be higher, and that will also diminish your ability or region's ability to rise above and stay above the 15% threshold that the state has set. As a, uh, a related point, we have seen that the average age of those admitted with COVID has risen over the past couple of weeks. It had been uh, uh, below 60, now it is above the age of 60. We also know that most of the individuals who have the worst outcomes and uh, pass away because of COVID are in fact uh, our oldest Californians and those with underlying conditions. And that is another important factor of our ability to protect those most vulnerable, to not just serve and support them and their families, but also to support the overall healthcare delivery system that we are looking after now. Again, if these projections are above that 15% at any day or time, then the region is released from the order. This is not, when I say it remains in Southern California, the order remains in San Joaquin Valley. It is not to say that it is there again for at least another three weeks. It could be um, shorter than that, depending on how these four factors come together on a day over day basis. And again, if the projection is below 15, that region remains. Next slide, please. So we will end with this. Uh, it's been a number of weeks since we've had a conversation about our blueprint. You'll remember at the end of August, we unveiled our blueprint for a safer economy, four tiers, uh, purple, red, orange, and yellow. Early on, many, many counties were in purple and we spent the better of two months moving counties through these various tiers, which allowed for fewer restrictions, more uh, business sectors to operate at higher percentages of their normal business, uh, even had uh, uh, relation to everything from uh, worship and schools and uh, sort of many of the things that we, we uh, uh, normally enjoy and participate in. But it's been many weeks since really we've had anything to update. The uh, biggest updates have been uh, county by county moving into the purple 
built here across the state. But today, uh, there is one county, Humboldt County, that has met the threshold, the same thresholds that we've always used under the bl blueprint to move from purple to red tier. So today, 54 counties remain in purple, three in red with this addition of Humboldt, one in orange and zero in yellow. Next slide, please. So as always, uh, it's a reminder that together we can stop this surge. Uh, we didn't spend as much time as we normally do, but I will now remind you that uh, much of what we're dealing with is avoidable. Much of what we are seeing can be stopped if we collectively make decisions to stop it. And those decisions are to wear our mask, to stay at home as much as we can at this critical time, and when we do go out to make sure that we keep physically distanced, that we don't mix with anybody outside of our household for the time being, and that we do as much as we can to keep our mask on. Those simple tools, I know we've talked about it for so long. Many of you are tired, tired of hearing it and tired of doing them, but we are in this moment where it can really make a difference that each of us has the tool and the power to actually save a life, get the transmission rate down, and help somebody, maybe they are in our family, maybe they aren't, maybe they are in our community or maybe they're far away, but still nonetheless, a Californian shoulder to shoulder with us and we wanna continue to be about supporting and saving lives as much as we can as we get through this winter search. I know we've just gone through an important holiday period. Uh, we brace to see what levels of transmission we see coming out of these important the moments of celebration. But I'll remind you as we go into uh, the New Year's weekend, do as much as you can, decide to celebrate virtually, um, make a decision to protect yourself and your fellow Californians and help us stop this surge. So with that, I'll end and just thank you and, and wish you all a safe and uh, productive New Year. And I'll take the next set of questions. Don Thompson, the Associated Press. Sorry, I had to get off mute there. Um, can you please explain in plain language and in more detail how the ICU capacity itself is calculated? You did some of that, but how does that explain data that shows a county has hundreds of beds available, like Los Angeles County, and yet that region is still listed as uh, having 0% capacity? How is that? Uh, how is that possible? Um, the discrepancy there. Thank you. Sure. So um, from the beginning, we have looked uh, to make sure that our ICUs, our whole healthcare delivery system, is not just available to take care of COVID patients, but for all our patients. And so when we have seen uh, hospitals with ICU capacity used up for COVID above thirty percent. We consider that ICU in that facility or that region's ICU capacity really ill prepared to serve and support individuals with other sorts of urgent and emergent needs like heart attacks, strokes, other trauma. So we do uh, essentially protect some of that capacity to make sure we can take care of other much needed services in those facilities. And so in some ways we adjust that rate to make sure that we have that capacity, not just for COVID, but for others. And so whatever we take as the actual um, uh, uh, capacity in a specific facility or in a specific region, if in fact that region's ICU capacity is used up primarily for COVID, uh, we consider that region at risk for not being able to provide other important critical care for these other things that I've mentioned. Laura Court, the Sacramento Bee. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thanks for taking our questions and giving us this uh, important information today. Um, I wonder if it might be appropriate as we're approaching the end of the year um, to look back at the last couple of months, the last nine months. Um, I wonder if you could share what you um, feel California has done really well and maybe what lessons the state has learned during this pandemic um, and maybe were there things that um, the state didn't anticipate that was simply out of the control of public health officials? 
Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a it, it's an incredibly important question, and I, I do uh, save some time and with the team and with others that I trust and value to reflect on what the last uh, 10 months has looked like for us. And I'll remind you, we started this in January, talking about repatriation flights and and uh, cruise ships and really how we were going to prepare for those first cases. So we've had a long time to think this through. Uh, I'll try to be concise with the answer, but I will say, as I reflect back, I'm incredibly proud to be part of a state and a leadership team, not just at the state level, but across the counties that made hard decisions early to really save lives. In those first few months, we could have easily had a tremendous level of spread had we not had local leaders and state leaders that made the decisions that they did. And we wouldn't be talking about this one necessarily as our hardest or worst surge. We might have, but we would have certainly had a significant degree of lives lost early on. And we didn't in California because of the actions. We had a chance to prepare and learn um, about different therapies, about things like when to put a patient on a ventilator, when to just use uh, different, uh, less invasive forms of respiratory support, how to staff up our clinics and our hospitals, how to use different medications that we've used in other disorders and diseases successfully with COVID as well. So all of those tools have literally given us time to learn and save many, many lives across the state. We of course uh, learned a lot about what it means to reopen and how to do that successfully, how to bring counties along, how to address the diversity across California north and south, east and west, quite different communities, quite different personalities of the communities, and really working with our local partners to make sure we have messages and a form and a, and, and a method that does balance the needs of our diverse communities across the state. Um, I think the piece that I, uh, I think is really important to acknowledge is that COVID fatigue the level of exhaustion that people feel, the trauma that people feel in their communities, the level of impact on our day-to-day -day lives has been tremendous. And wherein we might've been able to do it for three, four, five, six, seven months, getting to this point, uh, it feels long for many people. And acknowledging that and trying to work with our communities to find ways to hold on a little longer to get through, this period of extreme difficulty uh, where we're losing Californians uh, day over day in, in large numbers because of some of the actions that I know most are not, you know, acting in a, in, in a uh, malicious way or in a harmful way. It's just fatigue and tired. And so how do we refine our messages and bring our communities along? How do we look to other local leaders and messengers to really work with our communities to do all we can at this critical time. Um, so those are some of the highlights that I think about often and I reflect on uh, with a number of our other leaders and continuing to try to do all we can to get through uh, this difficult time, but also prepare for a time when we do have uh, uh, wide scale distribution of the vaccines that we do bring back certain things that we've had to defer for quite some time and we start doing those again. How do we do those safely? How do the lessons of the last many months help us do those uh, in the best way possible while making sure that we stay safe and we get to the other side of this um, with as many Californians and as much of California uh, uh, standing strong, standing stronger actually than we were before this pandemic. Ron Lynn, the Los Angeles Times. Hi, Dr. Daly. Thanks again for taking our questions. It's been super important for us to understand this complicated pandemic. I have several questions for you. First, are you aware of any hospitals that have had to begin to ration care or declare they are in crisis care? And if so, in what counties? And will this be publicly disclosed? disclose when it happens. Second, I'm hearing about ER so full that emergency doctors are assigned 16 patients per hour. Do you believe the quality of care has deteriorated to the point that the likelihood of dying is now greater? Finally, there's a problem with supplying oxygen 
to hospital patients in LA County. At least one hospital in Gardena has told us they're low on their supply of oxygen. Are you aware of any deaths associated with this shortage? And can anything be, be done about this? Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, so I, I heard a, a few, I, I heard most of your question that you were cutting in and out, but uh, I believe I have the three parts, so I'll start with them. And uh, if I miss them, somebody can remind me and I'll try to pick it up later. But to your first question, um, there's no doubt this is a continuum. You don't cross a threshold from contingency care into crisis care. There are decisions along the way, and these decisions don't just happen happen in hospitals. They happen with our emergency services systems and how uh, even as we have set protocols in the county I live in, in Los Angeles County, where our uh, uh, EMS providers are, uh, you know, assessing patients and releasing them to stay at home because they aren't quite sick enough to need hospital level care that if they did come to the hospital, they may not get the type of attention that they might expect and they continue to be monitored. In some ways, that is certainly an example of doing something that's atypical, unusual, and people might say is a form of contingency care. So those decisions are happening throughout impacted regions now. There are emergency room physicians and ICU clinicians and nurses uh, looking at how they stretch themselves effectively to so many different patients, and of course, as I was sort of describing in the rubber band analogy, that if you stretch far enough, certainly the ability to address all of a patient's needs, to address um, the demands of new patients becomes uh, uh, harder. And uh, certainly care can and is suffering because of the level of overwhelm some of these facilities have taken on. With regard to your question about uh, transparency, we have asked, and part of what uh, Director Kim McCoy Wade uh, was uh, uh, describing was uh, a new, uh, newly released, and frankly, a lot of it is a reminder by the California Department of Public Health to all facilities, all acute care hospitals in the state about their obligation to be prepared to think through crisis care ahead of time, to do all they can, a checklist released to make sure that facilities are doing what they can to prevent going into crisis care. And when they do cross that sort of continuum and they're moving towards more crisis care decision-making to have a notification made to both the local public health department as well as the California Department of Public Health. To your last question on oxygen, we have been for many weeks looking at uh, issues around oxygen, not just the availability of oxygen, the containers that might be mobile, wall-based oxygen, not just the availability of oxygen, but actually the ability for hospitals in, uh, in spaces where they aren't usual, used to delivering oxygen to be able to do it in facilities where, uh, you know, they've been able to handle a degree of delivery of oxygen at one level, but that we surpass it because so many patients need high flow oxygen or are on ventilators that the capacity of the building is stretched to a point where they can't effectively deliver oxygen. So we are working with partners at the county level and the region level from the state, our uh, amazing leaders at the California uh, 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 Cal OES uh, who are working to make sure we meet all of those needs. Uh, we have been reached out to by specific hospitals around oxygen needs, and we're doing all that we can to not just meet those needs from a state and local uh, resource effort, but also uh, helping support partnering through uh, nearby facilities to make sure the needs for those patients are met as quickly and effectively as possible. Christine Mai Duke, The Wall Street Journal. Hi, Dr. Galley, thank you so much for taking our questions. I have um, three questions. First of all, I just wanted to clarify um, a follow-up to Ron's question just now. Um, are you saying that you're not aware of any hospitals throughout California um, that are in the crisis care 
um, category already. I mean, you, you mentioned kind of some of those decisions and difficult assessments that are being made already, but you kind of uh, related that to contingency care versus crisis care. Some of the things that we're hearing from doctors in Southern California, including, you know, ambulances having to circle um, before they can drop off patients at, at the hospitals or patients being treated in um, the ambulance or in, you know, beds or in gift shops or whatever have you, um, it sounds a little bit like the crisis care that you described. Um, so if you could clarify that. Secondly, if you could go into more detail about what is happening in Southern California right now um, that makes it so concerning. Um, I know that there's been a little bit of a pause, um, a, a flattening of new cases um, in elsewhere in the state, but you know, what is it about Southern California and the hospital situation and capacity situation right now um, that really concern statewide officials. And then thirdly, I know that Governor Newsom um, referenced a team of the state folks who are going to be coming down to Los Angeles. I don't know if they're here yet, if you could um, if you could clarify that and what exactly um, they'll be doing operationally. I, I wonder if the capacity to coordinate uh, hospital capacity um, didn't exist already or that it wasn't it needed to be strengthened somehow. If you could go into more detail about what those folks will be doing. Thank you. Sure, yeah, thank you for the question and uh, opportunity to clarify. So we have not been noticed by a facility that they are in crisis care, uh, uh, that they have instituted their crisis care guidelines. That said, it's absolutely true, and let me just be crystal clear, that some hospitals in Southern California have uh, put in place some uh, practices that would uh, be part of crisis care. Uh, whether those are decisions about how uh, ambulances are received into the facility or how stretched uh, staff become to care for patients, looking at the effectiveness of uh, certain treatments for certain patients who are unlikely to survive or do well, that is happening in uh, facilities in Southern California. We have not heard yet that any hospital is at the point where they need to make a decision between two patients who both need a ventilator and they only have one ventilator. We have not heard or been alerted to any of those sort of situations. So again, across the continuum, the sort of gravest nature is that we are rationing care like ventilators, that we are rationing staff entirely. Um, those decisions we have not heard are being made across California, but we certainly know that Southern California hospitals are in crisis and some have begun to implement parts of crisis care and they are doing so hopefully with strong leadership teams under levels of preparedness and uh, moving forward to do all they can to get out of any of the situations that are crisis care back into contingency care. In terms of your uh, second question, the specifics around what's happening in LA. Um, certainly, wherein the rest of the state is seeing potentially, we hope, uh, a trend of reduced transmission, fewer cases today than yesterday, hopefully fewer cases tomorrow than today, a reduction in test positivity, and hopefully in the next 10 to 12 days, a reduction of demand by COVID uh, patients with COVID for hospitalization and ICU. We are not seeing that story necessarily in the southern part of the state. We still see, as I shared earlier, in our effective rate above one, lower than it was before. So maybe the transmission, the rate of rise is still low, it has come down, but the fact that it still is rising is concerning. And with that in mind, we should expect that the hospitals that are under duress, that are in crisis already, will continue to see a high number of patients knocking on the door asking for care, ambulances that still need to find a place to, to, to drop off a patient so they can get back into the field to support other patients who need care. We described yesterday that um, a significant number, over 95% of LA's hospitals have been on diversion in the last 24 hours. That changes day over day, but it's probably somewhere between 90 and 95%. And not only are they spending two hours on diversion, but they're spending a majority of the day on diversion. 
So all of those trends tell me and give me continued concern that we need to continue to work to prepare for a uh, next holiday surge of cases into the early part of next year. And that uh, likely projections that in the middle of January, we will see a significant higher number of cases than we have today of individuals with COVID who need hospitals, uh, hospital level care. And what is the what is the driver? It is what I said earlier that we can change this. We can make decisions to bend that curve faster, farther, and help our hospital system, our nurses, our physicians, our respiratory therapists, our EMS providers, all of those who are day in day day out providing care to to have a little relief and to be able to return to conditions where they can with a greater degree of confidence to the high quality job we expect to have when we do go to the hospital. Uh, I think those were the, the, the crux and the main questions that you asked. Next question, please. Final question, Nico Savage, the San Jose Mercury News. Thank you. Uh, you know, on the point of, of what we're gonna be seeing in a, in a couple of weeks, um, Given what we know about incubation periods for the virus, is there a concern that, you know, obviously we're in this week between Christmas and New Year's, that you could see some level of, of kind of compounded spread where, where people maybe got infected during a gathering at Christmas to then spread it if they're also gathering at New Year's, they're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic? Um, or is, the, is, it, is it really just more that issue of the, the general level, uh, the general presence of the virus in the community that's, that's, that's the yeah, it's a great question and it's both. Um, we know that a number of people are going to be newly exposed over the next, uh, over the weekend, that the urge of many Californians to gather and do so in ways that really aren't COVID safe are going to lead to some transmission. We hope the pleas over these last few days before the New Year's and the celebrations uh, that are planned. We hope some are canceled, some are done differently so that we can maintain and uh, bring down this spread. But we know and expect that some of that will happen. Uh, and it is both. It's people who are newly exposed there and others who had been exposed, infected, are still asymptomatic, may always be asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic. To decide to gather and spread at these other at these other events. So absolutely, this sort of concept of a surge upon a surge or exposure upon exposure is real. I think you and your question articulated it really well. That the Christmas gathering and infection becomes amplified uh, a bit more exponential over the New Year's New Year's celebrations. And we could see the worst of it in early January. And frankly, many of the hospital leaders that I've talked to in Southern California are bracing for exactly that. A significant surge, a significant need to not only deal with what we've seen up until now, but in an even more extreme condition in the middle and second part of January. So with that, I know it was a lot of information. I appreciate a chance to a answer all the questions, appreciate the reporters who uh, day over day, week over week, uh, really work hard to tell a uh, consistent, coherent, clear story to all of our public. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I know that we're continuing to move through a tough time, but uh, I uh, plead with each of you, ask you in your reporting and your, your articulation of the story, that, that you do um, ask all Californians to consider the decisions over the next many days and many weeks as we work our way through this surge and a pretty tough time for uh, uh, not, not just a handful, but hundreds, thousands of Californians who are dealing with loved ones or themselves infected with COVID. So with that, uh, I look forward to seeing you soon, likely in the new year.